Um, we had this idea of doing this Agile camp thing, and we were bouncing around, and we said, gosh, who would, who would actually come to the Silicon Valley and speak about agility or an Agile mindset or culture? And Mita said, hand up, I know who. I used to work with him, and his name's Rich Sheridan, and he's got a great shop. And you've really got to know Rich to appreciate what Rich is all about. So I picked up his book, flipped through the pages, and I was completely engaged with the story that he had to tell. Now, fast forward, here we are five years later. That was five years ago. And uh, Rich has uh, let me know that he has spoken at every single venue that we've had. So he's spoken at PayPal, Nike, Capital One, and now here at Prudential. So with that, Richard, thanks for coming. Come on up. Thank you. All right, I'm trying to imagine tomorrow you go into work, your, your boss who isn't here says, so what'd you do yesterday? What'd you learn? And you're going to say stuff like weak sauce and badass. <laughs> you're going to talk about hot racking and nuclear submarines. And then, yeah, and that last guy, he talked about joy and love. And you're like, where the heck were you anyways? I thought you were going to an Agile conference. Uh, how many of you, uh, by show of hands, have been to Menlo? No, Menlo, Menlo Innovations, my company. Yeah, so there's a, there's a few of you in the room who've been there. Uh, for the rest who haven't, I'm going to give you a little peek. Uh, warning, this is a book trailer. Uh, I guess normally I would say my intention isn't to sell books, but actually my intention is to sell books. Laura's sitting there with a stack of books she doesn't want to take home with her. But that's not why I'm showing you the book trailer. It's a 90-second peek into the company that I'm going to describe in the following slides in the talk, and I figured this 90-second video is a good way to give you an introduction to kind of set your mind for what you're about to experience. Most organizations don't really spend much time thinking about their culture. Most organizations operate in chaos. Everyone wants to work on something that's bigger than themselves. I did. I started out in an industry that I was very excited about. Very quickly I hit a trough of disillusionment. And by 1997, when I was promoted to Vice President of Product Development, I wanted out. I wanted to get as far away from this industry as I could. And then in that moment, I decided to change the industry. And that's the story that I've captured in this book. People are coming from all over the planet to come visit this space that's in the basement of a parking structure in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. And they're coming for a reason. They're coming to see something. What most people are looking for is some lessons around what it takes to build an intentionally joyful culture. Imagine half of my team had joy and the other half didn't. Which half would you want working on your project? We had so many requests for these tours, we realized it was time to share this story with the world in a different way. And that's how the book came to be. space is flexible. We work two to a computer, we assign these pairs, we switch them every five working days. The human energy that results from this kind of organization, you can actually feel the joy when you're in the room. My name is Richard Sheridan and I'm the author of Joy Inc. All right, yes, pick up your copy today. Uh, <laughs> whoa, there's a ten dollar bill sitting here. Stacy, is this, this is my speaker fee here? Just <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so before I launch into uh, what's going on inside of Menlo, I feel it's important for you to understand just a little bit of my personal journey uh, because a lot of people ask me, how did we come up with all the crazy stuff we do? And you have to understand, I started out in this industry when I was just a kid. Don't worry, this won't be that long a story. 
But in 1971, I typed a two-line program into a computer. The computer kids, uh, we did have computers back in those days. We really did. Uh, but they operated differently. It came back on a roll of paper and clacked out, hi, Rich, uh, because that's what I told it to do. And I was hooked. I knew what I wanted to do the rest of my days. I decided at 13 years old what my profession was going to be. And so uh, by 1973, I typed the entire baseball register into that computer. So my friends and I could play baseball in the winter Michigan months uh, by picking our lineups, playing against each other. I'm pretty sure my life is riddled with those kind of lost opportunities along the way because obviously that kind of stuff eventually turned into fantasy baseball. I just wanted to play baseball on the computer. Um, I won an international programming contest that year with that program, and that got me my first job as a programmer before I could drive. People supplying the compute power said, hey, you want to you come work for us? And I said, doing what? And they said, programming. I'm like, you can get paid for doing this? <laughs> and they said, yeah. I said, how much? They said, $3 an hour. And I'm like, are you kidding me? That's a dollar an hour more than I make in a dishwasher at the local big boy. This is awesome. And so that kind of launched my professional career at that point as a programmer. And uh, over the next few years, I continued to work. Eventually, went up to the University of Michigan. Any, any Wolverines in the crowd? No. Oh, there we go. Go blue. There we go. Uh, and I got a couple of degrees, bachelor's and master's degree in computer science, computer engineering. And by 1982, my career was launched. And I will tell you, that was a heady time in the industry. The PC was just coming out. Uh, we were going from a world that Ken Olson believed at digital equipment that there would only be a need for four computers in the nation to Bill Gates believing there would be one on every desktop. And so this was a heady time in the industry, and quite frankly, the career that followed for me was, by all world measures, perfectly successful. I was getting raises and stock options and promotions and greater authority and greater responsibility and all this sort of thing. The way the world measures success, I had it. My wife was delighted with me. <laughs> there was only one significant problem, and she saw it too. There was a different line operating at exactly the same time, and it looked like this. I was falling out of love with my profession by my mid-30s. As the video says, I wanted out. And when I say I wanted to get as far away from this industry as possible, what I was contemplating was a canoe camp in the boundary waters of Minnesota. Yeah, the women always laugh the same way. <laughs> Just like my wife still does to this day. She's like, really, dear? <laughs> Did you really think the girls and I would follow you to the boundary waters of Minnesota? But I can guarantee you there'll be at least one guy in the room who pulls me aside later and says, Rich, how far did you get with the canoe camp idea? <laughs> right? Come on, let's talk. Did you have a plan? So what was going on down here? Why could it possibly be that much of a gap? Well, quite frankly, it's because I was operating in chaos. Chaos in the software industry is easy to imagine. Uh, Things go bump in the night, there's emergencies, there's uh, firefighting. I would come in most every day not knowing what to expect in my day. Whether it was programming at one end of my career or VP at the other end, it was firefighting from one end of the day to the other. I would come home after very long days, my cold dinner, sitting in the microwave, ready for reheating, missed another family dinner, and my wife would look at tired me and she'd say, honey, you look really tired. Did you get a lot done today? And I'd be like, no, I got nothing done today. There were meetings, there were phone calls, there was firefighting, there was running from one place to the other, but nothing was getting done. And so in that world of chaos, in the software industry, you guys know this as well as anybody, things go bump in the night, don't they? The story I tell in the book is the tired a uh, programmer at Knight Capital Group who made a pretty straightforward server update error, and within 45 minutes, their New York Stock Exchange trading platform traded $7 billion worth of securities they weren't supposed to, costing Knight Capital Group $400 million in 45 minutes. Would, would that be a negative event here at Prudential? Yeah. I, I'm just curious, you know. Um, 
you know, I, I, today if I was writing that chapter again, uh, I'd probably use the number 143 million. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? It's amazing how a number now is emblazoned in our mindset when Equifax releases basically every adult's social security number, address, and phone number to the world. Um, so in the world of negative events, and I never had any quite as big as this, but I had my share of them, there's an organizational response, isn't there? We need to make sure this doesn't happen again. And this is where big, thick, three-ring binders full of templated documents come together, uh, stage gates, committees, sign-offs. We call it a software development life cycle or some you know, boring acronym like that. The three-ring binder goes on the shelf. People placate it. We have to put a police force in charge of it to make sure it's actually being paid attention to. We call it a project management office. <laughs> Making sure all the meetings are attended, all the sign-offs occur, all the documents are in order. And we go from chaos to full-blown bureaucracy. You go from the land of never getting anything done to the land of never getting anything started. Now, I will tell you, there will be somebody else who pulls me aside and says, who have you been talking to at our company? <laughs> Every conference I ever go to, somebody says, hey, this is our story. And of course, stuff still needs to happen, so shadow IT groups form. You begin learning how to placate the system while working around it simultaneously, which means you're operating in the best possible version of this, chaos and bureaucracy simultaneously. This was my life. This was where my heart was breaking. I used to think it was only me. I've come to find out, nope, it's our entire industry that's doing this to itself. Usually somebody wakes up one day and says, hey, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Let's, let's back this lever off a little bit. We went a little too far with our bureaucracy. Let's put together a small, staple together document for shorter, smaller projects, uh, an SDLC light version. Now people are like, well, who has he been talking to at our company, <laughs> right? And usually somebody wakes up when they find out even those meetings aren't being attended to, even those documents are essentially being forged with fake numbers and all that kind of stuff. So they, some executive comes in and says, cancel the SDLC, fire the PMO, we're agile now. And usually all that really means is you've just chosen chaos again, and you're back to there. So that's where I was, struggling. Looking ahead in my mid-30s for the next 30 years of my career saying, uh, no, I can't do this anymore. I can't stay in this industry. Now, those who know me well know I'm an eternal optimist. I was stuck in a room full of manure. I was going to keep digging till I found the pony. Because <laughs> I knew there was a pony in here somewhere. So my journey out led me to authors and books, but not books on technology. Because quite frankly, technology is trivial compared to how to better organize human teams into more effective units. This is the challenge we face big time in our industry today. In my early career, one or two people could sit down and create an operating system in a couple of months. Now Microsoft assembles 10,000 people for five years to create a failed operating system like Windows Vista. <laughs> and so the books I was drawn to were titles like The Fifth Discipline by Peter Senge. Peter Drucker's books on management, Tom Peters' In Search of Excellence, John Naismith's book, Megatrends. These books were pointing me to a better way of doing things than was customary, they just didn't tell me how to get there. But by 1997, I had become VP. By 1999, while I was continuing to struggle, two things happened in quick succession. I read a book by a guy named Kent Beck on something called extreme programming. And then I saw a video on an industrial design firm in California called IDEO. And I had a click moment. And I had the perch. I now could move a team forward. It wasn't easy, but over the next two years, I transformed a 30-year-old tired public company to something that looks just like what you saw at Menlo today. And I might still be there to this day had the internet bubble not burst. 
The California parent that had bought us shuttered every remote office they had, including our Ann Arbor office. I went home and told my wife that I'd laid off my whole team and they don't need a VP for an empty team. And so I'd lost my job. And she looked at me with tears in her eyes. You know, the guy from 1973 to 2001 had some way, shape, form, or another been either setting, laying the foundation for a great family life or provided it directly. And she looked at me and she said, you're unemployed? And I said, no, honey, I'm an entrepreneur now. <laughs> Hang on to that one, guys. You might need it. <laughs> Took her six months to figure out entrepreneurship actually pays less than unemployment. By then, we were profitable. And so what I discovered, you see, they could take everything away from me in 2001, couldn't they? Take my job, my title, my office, my team, my paycheck, my stock options, everything gone, save one thing. What they could not take away from me is what I had learned in those two years. And what I had learned was that the answer to this picture is not the perfect dial setting. <coughs> What I had learned is that the answer to this picture is a replacement. A replacement that is so familiar to us, we began learning it back in kindergarten, that what humans crave more than anything else is systems and simple structure, simple, repeatable, measurable, visible structure that feed human relationships and feed human energy. If we can find these things, and put them in a systematic, simple, non-bureaucratic mecha mechanism, we can get to something that I now call joy. Now, I will tell you that joy is an unusual word in business. People have asked me, where does the joy come from for you, Rich? Why would you talk about joy in the context of business? And I had to dig deep. I thought back to that 13-year-old kid who typed the two-line program into the computer, and I thought, that's where the joy comes from for me. And then I realized, no, that's not enough. Just creating technical things, doing technical work, that's not the essence of joy for somebody like me. What I realized was I had to go back to an earlier version of me, a 10-year-old version of me, when my parents in 1967 had bought the equivalent of an IKEA bookshelf. A piece, a new piece of furniture, which is a rare opportunity in our household at the time, and my mom wanted it in the living room. It was going to be eight feet wide and six feet tall, but it was out in the garage in a box, waiting to be assembled. My parents had gone out to dinner one night in a movie. My 10-year-old self was on my own that night. Me in the house, the box out in the garage, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to build that shelving unit. So I went out in the garage, and I pulled out those 50 pieces of wood, those 200 little nuts, bolts, and screws, that 38-page user manual over the next couple hours. I built that thing. It was bigger than me. And I'm like so excited, except uh, I built it in the garage, and Mom wants it in the living room. <laughs> Undaunted, the next hour, I inch that thing out of the garage, down the sidewalk, into the family room, through the kitchen, pushed it right into the place in the living room where mom wanted it. My 10-year-old memory says I didn't harm it a bit. <laughs> I set up dad's books, mom's knickknacks. I, I wired up the stereo. When they walked in the door that night, I had my mom's favorite album playing. And she was so excited and so delighted she cried. Joy. What I realized in that story for me and I think for an industry is Joy is derived from service to others. If the work of our hearts, our hands, and our minds get out, gets out into the world and delights the people it's intended to delight, that's the joy that drives the team. And I think we need to think about this. So my first message to you as a takeaway from my talk and perhaps this entire conference is asking yourself about your unit, your company, your organization, your team, two simple questions. Who do we serve? And what does delight look like for them? Because if we can start getting our team focused on what the Arbinger Institute calls an outward mindset, it's amazing how much the inward stuff, how big is my office, what's my title, how comfy is my chair, 
Do I have all the right tools? All that kind of stuff. If we can start looking outside to think about who we serve and what would delight look like for them, it's amazing how human energy will begin to feed a change initiative rather than simply resist it. There will be resistance. Humans, it's not that humans mind change. What humans mind is they resist being changed, right? But we have to, as leaders, we need to inspire them along a journey. And I simply will suggest to you thinking about who you serve. Not necessarily an easy question, because the easiest thing to say is, I serve my customers. And that may not be true. At Menlo, who we think about isn't the people who pay us to do custom software design and work. That's important. We do need to satisfy our paying customers. But our focus of attention are the users who will one day use the software we're designing and building. People who, who will not pay us for what we do, who we will typically never meet, not in the numbers we hope to attain, but who every day will come in and be influenced by the work of the hearts and hands and minds of the Menlo team. And I was being denied much of that. And so what I want to contemplate with you going forward is this. Does joy matter? Can you see it? Can you feel it? Can you touch it? And does it, in fact, solve enough problems to produce business value? And I will tell you, a lot of people come to visit to see what it is we're trying to figure out. We have between three and 4,000 people a year come from all over the world to spend anywhere from a day to a week with us digging deeper, trying to figure out how does Menlo do what they do? And I will tell you, one of the first things they're confronted with is one of those vilified open office environments you hear about. The Kind Fast Company magazine describes as an idea born in the mind of Satan in the deepest caverns of hell. <laughs> there are psychologists and psychiatrists and researchers with the data that proves these environments do not work, especially for introverted engineers. There are books, whole books written on this subject. Why do I know this? Because everybody, every time these articles come out, everybody I know sends them to me. <laughs> so if you want to be armed with the data and the research and the background and the wealth of things that have been written as to why this doesn't work, just write me. I can arm you, but you might want to leave right now because I'm not sure you'll want to hear the rest of my talk. Because people come in and say, so why does this work for Menlo and supposedly not anywhere else? And I tell them it's very simple. We didn't build an open and collaborative workspace. We built an open and collaborative culture. Our workspace is a reflection of our cultural values. A lot of organizations might come see Menlo, go back to their office, tear down the walls, and come back later and say, everybody hated it. Of course. Of course they hate it. Because you made no structural changes at all in the culture of your organization. You just saw changing the walls would help. Oops. Our space is also noisy. Again, contrary to what people believe about software development, that software development should be done in library quiet. You are looking at a guy who has either been a programmer or who, led, who now leads teams of uh, software teams and my career is almost at the balancing point. I have been working in this fashion for 18 years. And leading up to this was about 20 years in the old traditional way. I have the data myself that proves this outperforms the old way of, that I used to work 10 to 1. It's amazing how much this works. And interestingly enough, in our noisy environment, and it is the noise of work, we ban earbuds. You cannot block off the noise of your team members because in an open and collaborative culture, you want to be available to other people on your team. And the teamwork itself can be seen. It's not an org chart. The team is in charge of the space. The space is set up to be flexible and visual. The lightweight aluminum tables, the pull downs from the ceiling scream to the team, change me, and it changes in small ways every single day. And then every once in a while, a team just gets bored with the setup, tears it all down. My wife gets excited. She works there, too. She's of a Germanic tradition. It's an opportunity to get all the dust bunnies that have collected under the tables. And then a whole new setup comes into play. The team is in charge of the space. There are no space police. There's no space czar. There's no permission to ask. There's no bureaucratic 
uh, mechanism to satisfy the team changes the space and I will tell you for all of their years our team is in charge of how the tables are set up they push them front to front and side to side every major furniture manufacturer in the United States has come to visit us I think we scare them to death I remember one of them was in they saw our five-foot tables and they said hey man we could spread you out a little more we could give you six-foot tables and our team sat there and they said no we'd be too far away from the people sitting next to us they didn't even want an extra foot between them and the people sitting next to them. And we pursued and built the learning organization that Peter Senge talks about in the fifth discipline. But interestingly, while books are important to us, books isn't the way we did it. The way we did it was with the way we organized the people. You see, we work in pairs. We connect our team intellectually. We connect them emotionally. We connect them physically. Two people work at one computer all day long in the same task at the same time. This isn't come help me with my work. This is our work together. Those pairs are assigned and we switch them every five working days. If you have, you should have questions about that. We can maybe have some time at the end. But that simple construct of pairing our teams together and switching the pairs every five days in a very thoughtful process we go through is the central element of the open and collaborative culture we've made. And it also produces all of the noise because we're in conversation from one end of the day to the other. And then speaking of conversations, we knew there were three fundamental conversations we ultimately had to change in order to get this thing to work better, work better for the world, that is. The conversation we would have with ourselves, the conversation we would have with the people who pay us to do the work, and the conversation with what I will describe later as the lost tribe of technology. So I'm gonna walk through each one of those constituents, each one of those stakeholders. But I wanna draw your attention to this quote from John Nesbitt, that the most exciting breakthrough of what we're going to see in the century we're in right now is not going to occur because of technology, but because of an expanding concept of what it means to be human. This is, a, uh, this is an important statement. What's interesting to me about this statement is John Nesbitt made this statement in 1982. Crazy, right? There's a famous deli in downtown Ann Arbor called Zingerman's, and it's a popular spot for visitors and, and citizens alike, uh, residents of Ann Arbor. And one Saturday morning, I was sitting there having my coffee and bagel, on a, and uh, there was a couple sitting next to me with their two young children. And the entire time those parents were with their kids, they were doing this while the kids sat there silently. And I couldn't help but think, having raised three girls, how much I wanted to grab those two young parents and say, spend time with your children. This time will be gone before you know it. And yet, they were glued to their devices and what lesson are we teaching our kids? Now, interestingly, at Menlo, when we communicate internally, the conversation we have with ourselves is not electronic. We don't use email, we don't use Slack, we we use what we like to call high-speed voice technology. <laughs> it's awesome. The hardware was pre-installed at birth. <laughs> Vocal cords, tympanic membranes, auditory nerve stimulation of the brain supplemented by body language and eyebrows and tonal inflection. In fact, if we want to... Do you guys have meetings where you work? Anybody have meetings where you work? How many, show of hands, how many have meetings? Okay, we, we really don't. Uh, you know, some of the things we do might look like meetings. We think meetings are mind-numbing, spirit-sucking, energy-draining devices of management. So we do have a few. They're short, they're small, they're quick. All company meeting, for example, I'll demonstrate how we do this. Now remember, we're all in one big open room together. I sit out in the room with everybody else. There's no gifted C-suite for the CEO. Um, and so if I want to call an all-company meeting, you can try this too if you come visit. Uh, I just say, hey Menlo, and you're going to say, hey Rich. So let's practice it. Hey Menlo! Hey, and the whole place goes quiet. Nobody moves. We are now in an all-company meeting. 
No book the conference room, no checking calendars, no endless CC all emails to see who, who can make it and all that kind of stuff. Hey Menlo, hey Rich, we're in an all company meeting. Transact the business is amazing, say thank you, back to work, and everybody goes back to work without moving. About the only physical movement was a twist of the neck and maybe a refocusing of the lens in your eye to whoever's speaking. Now you can do this if you come visit. You walk in our front door and say, hey Menlo, you gotta say it loud. And they'll all stop and go, hey, you. <laughs> <laughs> and then you should have something to say at that point. <laughs> or it will get quickly uncomfortable. All right. So, and, and if I need to talk to Emily, I just say, hey, Emily. And, uh, you know, hey, Wilmot, if I want to talk to the Wilmot team. So uh, it can be subdivided down like that. We do have one meeting a day. It's our daily stand-up meeting. I'm sure a lot of you have stand-ups. Uh, ours are unusual in some regards, as you'll see in a second, but probably the most unusual thing about our stand-ups is the way they're called. Our daily stand-ups are called by a dartboard on the wall. How can a dartboard call a stand-up? Well, the dartboard has an alarm clock. Why a dartboard needs an alarm clock, we have no idea. <laughs> but it was programmable. We're programmers, so we programmed it. And at 10 o'clock every morning, Bong, 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 bong. And everyone, like Stepford children, gathers in a circle. Everyone in the room, whether there's 50 or 60 or 70 people, we have a stand up. Everybody comes. Uh, let me go back here for a second. The dogs come. Uh, and it is controlled by a two-horned plastic Viking helmet. That's why it's on the cover of the book. It's the iconic symbol of Menlo now. And the reason we like it is because as it passes around the circle, that because we work in pairs, we report out in pairs, and having a two-handle token really facilitates the movement. And that keeps the meeting under control. It goes around, everybody reports out in their pairs. Uh, general announcements, anything they're struggling with, any progress reports they want to make. Um, we have an unusual way of celebrating birthdays, even in stand-up, that you can ask me about later. And typically, the meeting ends at 10.13. I can't explain why. The only reason we know is, when we get done, we look at the dartboard and it says 10.13. 13 minutes for 50 or 60 people to conduct an entire stand-up. Uh, we, this is one of the biggest takeaways from Menlo that people have. They come, they see it, and they're like, oh, we want to try stand up at our organization. I'm like, great, just try it. I had a call from one organization. Once they called me up and said, Rich, our team isn't as big as yours. Our stand ups are taking 45 minutes. I'm like, really? And they're like, yeah, can you help us diagnose? I said, sure, I'll come in, I'll tend one, see what goes on. Sure enough, 10 o'clock, they did shows 10 o'clock, same as we did. Uh, they all gathered in a conference room, which I thought was a little odd, but that was their organization's building. And then they sat down. And I'm looking at them like, what are you doing? They're like, what do you mean? I said, it's a stand-up. <laughs> and they're like, yeah. I said, you're sitting down. And they said, yeah. I said, it's a stand-up. And they said, Rich, we can't stand for 45 minutes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay. You can ask me later how we really keep it short. The key thing we don't do is solve problems in the meeting. That's what keeps it short. Then we had to change the conversation with our customers. Software is a very theoretical exercise until there's something to actually touch. And in our world, we try and produce it on a weekly basis, something worthy of touching. And what we do is we reverse the roles in this event we call a show and tell. And what I mean by reversing the roles is we have our customers show us the work we did the previous five days. We don't do it the other way around. Because you see, if you don't put the customer front and center, if you don't put their hands on the keyboard and mouse, they may sit in the back of the room and disengage. They may say, oh yeah, that's fine. Oh yeah, that's okay. All good. You know. Do you know what disengagement in a meeting actually looks like? You can measure this inside of your organization. Watch for this the next time you have a meeting in your company. There'll be somebody in the meeting, maybe you, who about less than 60 seconds into the meeting does this. <laughs> and then, you know, somebody says, hey, Rich, I think you had something to say on this topic. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, what? Were, were, were you talking to me? Oh, where were we at? I was getting ready for my next meeting. What, what were we talking about? Yeah, how many of you have ever seen that behavior in a meeting? 
today. Uh, <laughs> how many of you are doing it right now? <laughs> okay, so we look for very specific ways to keep the people engaged, and the people who are watching our customer do this are the people who did the work, who want to see the visceral reaction of our client reacting to things they did in the previous five days. This is very important to us. And then we go into this really odd part of Menlo, we go into a planning game. Odd in the sense of the tools we use. We don't use electronics here either. We use simple paper-based tools for planning. We estimate in hours. We write all of the work down in a handwritten index card. We write the estimate of hours on the card. This is a 16-hour card. This is an eight-hour card. Are you catching the spatial relationship between these two? If not, I've also brought a four-hour card for your... <laughs> and then the client prioritizes the work against the three fundamental characteristics of professional project management. Time, one week. Humans, two people. Budget, 80 hours. Two people working together for 40 hours. And the way they prioritize is by picking the cards, the folded cards up off of the table and laying them down in their budget. See how this works? Simple, repeatable, measurable, visible, that feed human energy and build human relationships. The customer collaborates with us, looking through all of these artifacts. They get very invested in the outcome because they understand it. I can, let me teach you our project management system here. Add. Delete. You have now learned our project management system. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to figure out. Edit. All supported by simple handwritten index cards. Yeah, we used to write in pencil. Uh, when we did FDA validated medical devices, they actually required us to start writing in pen. That was the change they made for us. Um, why do we like handwritten artifacts? Because we believe it is fundamentally impossible to not read something you yourself wrote by hand. Whereas a document where you cut and paste, drag and drop, take a, a document off of a shared folder and drop it onto an email and send it off, my belief is that a lot of those things we believe are valuable artifacts have never ever been read even by the people who created them. And then we put up these uh, work plans on a wallboard display for all to see out in the middle of the room. Remember, transparent culture. By putting everything up on the wall, we remove a lot of fear from the team. That also is an act of leadership. And each swim lane represents two people assigned to work together for the week. The cards are placed next to the day. We expect them to complete based on the estimates that came from the team. The yarn indicates, as PMI would call it, a schedule performance index. Uh, where are we at in the five-day cycle? This project happens to have a Wednesday to Tuesday cadence, so we're four days into the project, and now the question is, how are we doing? Are we on track for where we thought we were? And that's where we look at these simple stickers, these circular little dots, colorful dots on the cards. The yellow says that's the card is being worked right now, and orange says we think we're done. Now, in programmer land, because uh, remember, I coded for about 20 years in my career, Programmers have as many different definitions for done as Eskimos have words for snow. <laughs> Don't they? You've all heard them. I said them. Well, it's done. It's not done, done. <laughs> right? Well, it's ready. It's not finished. <laughs> well, it's finished, but it's not complete. Well, it's complete, but it's not installable. Well, it's just installable, but it's not deployable. Well, right, you get the hint, right? You've all, yeah. how many of you have ever said any of those things? How many of you heard those in the last week? Yeah. Um, in our world, our programmers can only self-declare they think they're done. And then QA comes right around behind them and checks their work. QA likes what you see, green dot. It's like endorphin rush for the programmers. Done, ready for show and tell. QA doesn't like what they see. Red dot. Endorphin rush for the QA team. <laughs> How many of you, any QA professionals in the room? 
or, or former QA professionals in the room? Anybody willing to admit? I got, go ahead, okay, I see a couple of hands over there. So I want to arm, this is a, this is a sidebar takeaway because I only have one other takeaway. Remember, who do you serve and what would delight look like? That's my first takeaway. This is a sidebar takeaway just for the QA people. The next time, so QA people, when a programmer uh, says they're done and then you go check it and you find something, you go back to them and say, hey, by the way, I was checking your work and I found something. What's a programmer likely to say in that scenario? Yeah, it worked on my machine. <laughs> so here's your takeaway. It's, next time a programmer says that to you, immediately grab their computer and ship it to your customer. <laughs> they will never say that again. They can't. They lost their machine. Uh, <laughs> all right. Moving ahead. Lost tribe. The lost tribe of technology. You know what lost tribes are, right? The anthropologists are hacking their way through the Amazonian forest, and they come across an indigenous tribe, somebody that nobody has ever come in human contact before. In our world, we call them users. <laughs> Actually, let's be honest, we call them stupid users. Right? And then we write dummies books for those poor people. And then we get them to self-deprecate. Oh, you know me, I'm just a stupid user. Right? It's amazing how well we've done this. For our entire history, we are an industry of calls of people we serve stupid. It doesn't have to be that way. We injected a whole new practice to change that conversation with the people we serve and intended to delight. We call it high-tech anthropology. Go out into the world and study the people you intend to serve in their native environment. Don't invite them in. Don't invite them into a focus group because that's a dominant personality disorder group. <laughs> right? Don't send your programmers out and they oh, it's really easy. Just control, alt, delete. And you'll, it, you know, if you want to shut down your computer, just press the start button. That's a neat idea if you're willing to ship an engineer with every copy of your software or whatever you're deploying out into your world. What our anthropologists do is find out what would work for the humans. What are their goals? What's their vocabulary? What's their workflow? We want to honor the people we intend to serve. This is why we have a different set of people who do this. Empathetic, compassionate designers of human experience. But first, through observation, not through interview. This is very important. So we can lead the witness, can't we? Now, for years, in this moment, I would tell this really, like, sort of negative story about my user experiences with Comcast. This was my moment. I would tell you a bad Comcast user experience story. And, you know, what's the favorite cable network here in New Jersey? Comcast, okay. All right, so this would work for you. <clears throat> I can't do it anymore. It's awesome. I just upgraded from the normal Comcast to Xfinity, and it was a delightful experience. I don't know what the heck happened there, but it was from, from the contact at the store where I had to trade in my equipment to the installation that was seamless and I looked like IT hero to the actual daily user experience with that equipment. It's amazing, so I can't tell that story. You know, but Verifone came to my rescue. The stupid credit chip reading machines now are my favorite hunting target. Think about it. We're all tortured now. Credit card transactions have officially become painful, haven't they? Because you go up to the machine, my favorite's at McDonald's, there's a little blue chevron that's like, swipe me, swipe me. Swipe me, swipe me. So what do you do? Shh. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, it's a chip reader. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, you didn't put it in far enough. Oh, okay. No, sir, you have to pull it out and put it back in again. Okay. And then there's a blue screen that comes up, right? What does the blue screen say? Say. Do not remove card. Okay, all right, I got it. You got me trained now. And then it blinks and goes away, and there's another screen that comes up. What does it say? Please don't remove card. I'm serious. It, it, the blue screen comes up, and then the next screen comes up, and it still says, please don't remove card. So you're about to go, and you're like, okay. 
right? Yeah, I know you've all experienced this, haven't you, right? And you're like, how hard could this be? I've been using credit cards since I was 20. It's like for 40 years. And now it's painful. And then finally, I'm like, okay, you got me. And then, very subtly, it says, please remove card. But I'm like three feet away at this point. <laughs> and then what does it do? It beeps at you. Because you're a stupid user. And my favorite version of this is the Starbucks I go to where the final screen says, remove card, please wait. You cannot make this stuff up. No one at Verifone ever watched a single human being, a regular human being, use their product or they're cruel. High-tech anthropology, uh, so much more to say. It could be a whole separate or explanation. They have their own set of uh, user artifacts that are paper-based where we prioritize personas using a target map. They, our synthesizers and 3M's best customer, they bring in all this ambiguous information and so on. But the point being, do not torture your end users. Now, I've had credit card companies come into Menlo and I tell them about this, I say, you know your product's officially painful to use, right? And you know what they say, oh, that's not us. <laughs> <laughs> really, <laughs> it doesn't matter, Oh, we're all connected. Because now, I have an antidote. I pull out my phone, put one finger, near the device, and I go like this, in bliss. And for sure, Apple's gonna become a credit card company someday, and all the credit card companies are gonna be wondering, how did we get this intermediate? Because you're torturing your users. <laughs> Stop it. All right, last, last big message to you is this. This is, this is my key takeaway. Remember, first one was, think about who you serve. What would delight look like for them? This one is, you got done with an awesome day. Stacy puts together a tremendously good conference. You guys have been inspired from one end of the day to the other. And now you face the daunting challenge of picking up something from here and taking it home with you, don't you? Because your whole organization isn't here. You're gonna go back to the office tomorrow and you're gonna run up to somebody and you're like, plastic Viking helmets to run 60-person <laughs> stand-ups. And they're going to look at you like you're from another planet, and then they're going to, oh, that would never work here. That's, not, that's against policy. HR won't allow it. Facilities will nix the idea. I want to arm you with one simple phrase in that moment. Look them in the eye and say, yeah, I know, but let's run the experiment. Let's see what happens. Let's try something before we defeat it. Now, I'll give you an example of how an experiment plays out at my company. Ten years ago, little Maggie was born. Mom, Tracy, took off a few months from maternity leave. She was ready to come back, join an exciting new project we had. She came up and said, Rich, I'm ready to come back to work. I said, awesome, Tracy, we miss you. How soon can you be here? We could put you on the team on Monday. She's like, yeah, we got one problem. The daycare we plan to put Maggie in is full. Grandparents live too far away to help. My husband, John, and I don't know what to do with the baby. Now, I will tell you, in this moment, unknown to Tracy, there was a screaming match in my brain. The kind you know, the dark voice and the bright voice. The dark voice said, don't you dare say what you're about to say. <laughs> HR will kill you. The lawyers will freak the insurance policies go through the roof. Bright Boy says, your company, you're an entrepreneur, you can do whatever you want. You don't even have an HR department. <laughs> so I looked at Tracy, I said, bring her in. Now, if I'd only had a camera in that moment to catch the, catch the look of bewilderment on her face. She says, what do you mean? I said, bring her into work. She said, all day? <laughs> I said, sure. She said, every day? <laughs> I said, why not? And she looked around the big open room that is Menlo and she said, Rich, where will I put her? And I said, Tracy, she's a baby. She's not going anywhere. Just put her in a bassinet in the floor wherever you're working. She said, what if she makes a fuss? I said, here, it's like a noisy restaurant. You'll never hear it. She goes, come on, you raised three girls. You know what a big baby fuss looks like. It'll disturb the whole place. 
And quite frankly, this is probably where I grew up a little bit as a leader. I looked at her and I said, Tracy, you're the mom. I trust you. You'll do the right thing. We'll work it out together. Let's run the experiment. Now, isn't she adorable? <laughs> Funny thing is, that's not Maggie. <laughs> that is little Ellie. Ellie is Menlo baby number eight. We are now 10 years in. Menlo baby number 19 just arrived in the world, not yet at Menlo, a little too young for them. 19 in, or, uh, 20 and 21 are coming to the office every day, but they're not in the world yet, if you know what I mean. <laughs> this has been a delightful experiment. 21 Menlo babies in 10 years. Most of them coming into work for months at a time. Now, when you run experiments in your organization, I'm not telling you you need to bring babies in for this fragile transformation. Don't hang that one on me, okay? <laughs> Go ahead and try it if you want. I would highly recommend it. But here's the point about experimentation. When you run experiments, expect the unexpected, especially if it involves little humans, all right? You don't know what's going to happen. Adjust. This is almost the essence of Agile. Ellie learned a pair program. Didn't expect that. Ellie went to design meetings. Didn't expect that. <laughs> Little Maggie, the first Menlo baby, fussed. Of course she fussed. She's a baby. It was a team's response. We didn't expect. They'd run across the room like, no, it's my turn to hold the baby. <laughs> and then, this is Henry coming back to visit. And then something really magical happened. We discovered our customers behave better when you bring babies to meetings. <laughs> they don't yell at you. They don't swear at you. They don't raise their voice. They think you're awesome. So now babies are part of the marketing effort at Menlo. <laughs> Joy. This has been a delightful experiment for us. Yeah, we've always, Menlo has a built into their lease to have at least three dogs in our space, or at most three dogs in our space. I mean, who builds that into a lease, right? But the dogs have been important to our history and our culture. But this case, in this particular case, and this is just one other version of Run the Experiment, Michael, the gentleman in the orange shirt, was coming in for a show and tell. This happens to be Laura and Megan. Laura's, Laura's out there somewhere, I think, or in here. Um, and uh, Michael called me up and he says, hey, Rich, I'm coming to show and tell. Do you mind if I bring Buster? I'm like, sure. You can bring in whoever you want. He says, oh, Buster's my great Dane. I'm like, oh. <laughs> So Buster came in, he came in our big front door, he greeted me first, uh, he put his paws on my shoulder. I'm six foot five. His head was here. Okay, gentle giant of a dog, it was awesome. And I realized in this moment what was happening was very important. And this is something to think about as you consider transformations within your organization, because a lot of times it's all inwardly focused, right? We wanna transform our team. But think about what was actually going on here. Michael couldn't bring a dog into his workplace. It wouldn't have been appropriate. So nothing wrong with his employer. But when he interacted with us, he chose to be like us. Imagine the cultural transformation you take your team through. It's so powerful, the people you interact with, whether it's another business unit within your company or your external customers, that every time they touch you, they want to be more like you. That is a powerful place to take your team and maybe a vision for you. So run the experiment. You, there is no question you have to also, in the midst of everything you do, focus on the rigor and discipline to deliver the kind of results to the world that matter in a way that take on the responsibility that our inter industry needs. But ultimately, your responsibility as leaders within your organization is to build an organization that can learn faster than your competition. Thank you very much.